This is Floss Weekly. I'm Doc Searles. And this week, Aaron Newcomb and I talk with Jason Griffey of NISO about the Library Box project he worked on for a number of years, which is a really great project to have this private, on the net, but off the web, standalone thing that would work in libraries, but lots of other places and experiences with the success and failure of that in some ways, because technology and regulations and procedures and other things move on. And how do you keep something alive? And what is still useful about this thing? There's still promise in it and in other projects he's worked on. A lot of learnings in this one, and that is coming up next. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Floss Weekly, episode 709, recorded Wednesday, November 30th, 2022. The tiny free library that could. This episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Collide. That's Collide with a K. Collide is an endpoint security solution that gives IT teams a single dashboard for all devices, regardless of their operating system. Visit collide.com slash floss to learn more and activate a free 14-day trial today. No credit card required. And by Code Comments, an original podcast from Red Hat that lets you listen in on two experienced technologists as they describe their building process and what they've learned from their experiences. Search for Code Comments in your podcast player. Good morning, good evening, good whenever it is, wherever you are. I am Doc Searles. This is Floss Weekly. And I am joined this week by Aaron Newcomb in his his lair. There it is. His, uh, That's right. His, his background lair. <laughs> Probably yeah, looks something yeah, like my the virtual. real thing. It does. In fact, you can even see, wait, over on this side, you can see my son's dishes in here in this uh, picture I took. I forgot. <laughs> they were left there. I forgot to get rid of his. This is where he stores all of his dishes. He's got like five bowls over there. And this is where he plays all his games. And then I sit in the center position just right behind me there. But yeah, good to join you it's, today, Doc. Yeah. It's been a while since I've been on. It's been a while. It's, it's great to have you on the show. And I, I I want you on this one because it's it's about old stuff, in this case, stuff that not entirely about that, but stuff that's not necessarily worked out and lessons to be learned. Um, you're you're our retro guy. I think pretty much all our co-hosts are retro people to some degree, but you're all yeah. the way. You're, yeah, you're and I love hardware hacking. Lot. For sure. And I love hardware hacking as well. So I love hacking on Raspberry Pis and Arduinos and routers in some cases. Um, and I think that's somewhat related to what we're going to be talking about today. So I'm excited to learn about this project. And I'm familiar with Pirate Box. Um, hmm. And so this project, the Library Box, which I think is built off of that, we'll have to ask our guests, um, is somewhat familiar to me. But I don't know what the differences are. And I don't know when you would choose one or the other. And I don't even know what what hardware I should be using. So it'll be interesting to see. Uh, if I've got if I've got the hardware at my disposal, I'll grab it and uh, and attempt an installation uh, while we're talking. So. I, I was I was thinking if 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 you were to resurrect this project, that would be an interesting <laughs> an interesting outcome <laughs> and yeah. something to revisit. So I, I want to jump into it because I think there actually is a lot to talk about with our with our guest. It's uh, uh, Jason Griffey. He's the director of strategic initiatives at NISO. That's N-I-S-O, um, uh, which is, um, I I have to disclose, is, is run by my son-in-law, <laughs> my only and favorite son-in-law. Um, before that, he worked as an affiliate at the Meta Lab and a fellow at um, an affiliate uh, at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard, where I also served time, but only as a fellow. <laughs> I never got the affiliate badge. Um, uh, he's also written multiple books on 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 uh, AI and machine learning and libraries, um, and it just goes on. He's got such an extensive CV um, uh, and machine learning stuff. Yeah. Um, one of eight winners of a Knight Foundation News Challenge for libraries. And the and for the Measure of the Future project, he had the Library Box project. Those are the two main things we're going to be talking about. I think um, he says he can be stalked excess, obsessively online. Anyway, all of that aside, welcome to the show, Jason. Hey, Doc. It's so great yeah. to be here. Thanks for uh, the invite, and uh, I look forward to talking about 
you know, projects and uh, hardware hacking today. So, so, so I have an important question to start out with. Is you, sure. you all went to Carolina. Are, are you still Tar Heel by, by favor? I, I, I got. I got to tell you, I, I do. I do still. Do still claim the Tar Heels? Yeah. Yeah. yeah you still bleed uh, blue. Still, still bleed. There. Still bleed that color blue. You, you have to. <laughs> it's a very specific shade, especially very, in North Carolina. Yeah, it's a PMS you don't want to get darker. You don't want. No. You don't want that darker blue. Um, <laughs> we, don't, we don't claim the. We don't claim the uh, the the you know the Duke blue. So uh, well, you gotta I, be careful I, about that. I hate to say I do, because <laughs> I, I worked at Duke for a while, not physically yep. at Duke, but not in Duke. It was yep. one of those institutions hanging off the side. But I went to Duke games in the 70s when they started to not suck again, and nobody knew they would end up being like, you know, the yep. other Kentucky. Legendary, yeah. Legendary, yeah. So, um, so tell us about, I mean, it, it's, I mean, libraries are interesting to me, and and you're, you, you hack the physical library, it seems to me. That's where your interests lie, which to me, a library is not a library unless it's, 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 it's physical. And even though I, I love um, everything that archive.org is doing around that, um, but tell us about what, what got you into that and why you're still seem yeah. to be there. Sure, absolutely, yeah. 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 So, yeah, my background is as a librarian. I'm my my uh, have a degree in library science um, from UNC Chapel Hill. Um, but my sort of history is all technology. My you know, I grew up uh, doing you know learning basic on a Commodore sixty four, right? Like that uh, that sort of old school uh, old school computer um, computer programming, and so you know grew up hit college right at the heyday of the web. Um, so, you know, had that sort of long tail technology background and then discovered um, libraries and the sort of growth of libraries in that early 2000s, late 90s, early 2000s, um, when things really did sort of start cranking from physical to digital in the library space. Um, certainly lots and lots libraries have a extraordinary history of um, sort of creating new digital things the you know uh, online catalogs and early uh, search engines and things all sort of uh, began originating in the library space um, in as early as the 70s but the sort of late 90s early 2000s when I when I kind of came into that space um, was when there was a great deal of excitement uh, right about the web and about what it might do for libraries and so between that and my background in sort of general technology and my interest in hardware and in sort of open you know open source software open source hardware uh, when I got a job as an academic librarian, one of the very first things that I started sort of thinking through is what can I do in this space, right, in this new sort of world to get some of those tools to be valued in the space? How can I sort of help push open source software and then with the rise of sort of, you know, Raspberry Pi and some of the other open source platforms, what can we do with this stuff in, um, in the library space? So that's sort of where my interest and background and the, the ideas for the, the couple of projects that, um, that I, that I put together came from. Yeah, well, speaking of those projects, I mean, so that kind of leads us into Library Box specifically. Sure. Um, how did Library Box get started? How long has it been around? <clears throat> Who's using it? Et cetera, et cetera. Yep. Sure. Yeah. So Library Box was uh, a project that sort of came into my head in 2011 ish, something like that. Um, and it came from you. You mentioned uh, earlier the project Pirate Box, which was an early sort of open router system uh, developed by Dr. David Darts at NYU. Uh, Darts is an art professor, and it was uh, sort of late 2010, early 2011 that he developed this project um, Pirate Box, which was a 
uh, a, a router that was uh, a full size router. <laughs> um, I don't actually know the model that he originally used, but it was a full size router with like a big lead acid battery and a lunchbox uh, powering the whole thing that he flashed with some open um, open firmware and then uh, modified the firmware so that it became a upload download local area network right a little tiny web server where people could connect to it locally where right? no no other connection to the net no broader sort of uh you know uh, access anywhere just this hyper local little network that was available for people to grab things off of and drop things onto right super fascinating project really interesting in um Got a little bit of press. It was in Ars Technica and a couple of other, a uh, couple of other uh, online uh, news sources at the time. And I, I saw it, and my first thought was, well, that that's sort of like a little portable library, right? That's a, sort of like a like a like a little little uh, you know hyper local little digital library that you can carry around with you. Um, that sort of sparked the idea, and then in uh, mid-2011, something like that, uh, a hacker named Christian Rutten uh, ported it, ported Dart's project over to OpenWRT, and, uh, which was an open source um, firmware replacement for these little tiny travel routers. So it went from this project that needed sort of a big lunchbox and a full-size router and a big battery and like, you know, it was quite a little package that you needed uh, with this ha with the hack that Chris Christian put together, um, you could run it on literally like a thirty dollar travel router, and these are these little boxes are not particularly common anymore, but in twenty eleven they were fairly ubiquitous, and these were originally designed. Uh, the ones that were mostly used were by the company TP Link, and they were originally designed as little travel routers that you would take with you to the, the kind of built in purpose uh, pre hacking was that you would take them to a hotel and plug them into the physical ethernet right in the hotel room because hotels at the time still you know many of them didn't have Wi Fi public Wi Fi. And so you would plug the uh, plug the uh, Ethernet cable in, and it would give you in your room a little local Wi-Fi signal that you could you know bridge over to the to the Ethernet. And so these little travel routers though ran uh, just a you know a tiny little Linux kernel, and uh, when flashed with OpenWRT, you could get in and you could customize the interface, you could customize what it did, and you could really sort of get in and dig around in the guts of the thing. And so in 2011, late 2011, Christian uh, ported Pirate Box over to these routers. And that was when I said, ah, <laughs> okay. Now we went from something that was a couple hundred bucks to something that was $30. <laughs> and uh, I started messing around with it. And so the first thing I decided needed to happen sort of to convert it from a pirate box to a library box was um, libraries are one of one of the things that makes a library a library is that it's curated, right? That there are experts who sort of look at their community and decide what the uh, needs are, the information needs of the community are. And so it's not just anyone can bring a book in and leave it, right? That's a, that's a different thing. Uh, it's not a library, uh, if, that's, if that's what's happening. And so uh, I wanted to go in and strip out the sort of uploadability to take the pirate out of pirate box, more or less, mm -hmm. and then customize the interface to just make it more friendly for um, users so that when someone from a library went to uh, try and install this, that the, the result was something that was just sort of easier, right? Like it re reduced the friction of the user, make it easier for people to, uh, to, to install, make it easier for people to 
um, to, to use when they, when they discovered it and that sort of thing. And so I went through, created a bunch of documentation, changed the install procedure a little bit, uh, customized the interface, removed the uploadability. And, uh, that really was sort of the 1.0, sort of the test version of the, uh, of the project. And we, we, you know, went, went a long way after that. But uh, that was the uh, that was the the sort of you know or, 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 or origin story of the uh, of the thing. Yeah, I think it's a great idea um, uh, because you know there are people. I can. What are the use cases? Let me ask you because I was just about yeah. to say I can see a lot of use cases for this. No, no, no. It's not about yep. me. It's about you. <laughs> you no, no. That's what the use it, cases are. Like, where would you use it? What yep. uh, and who has used it? If you have examples of people like that have used it and been like, "Oh, this is great because we were able to do yep. such and such." Yeah. So the the fascinating thing is right that what is uh, the uh, Corey Doctor I was like one of his many laws right the street finds its use. Uh, oh no, that's Gibson. Sorry, I'm, I'm attributing uh, Gibson to Doctor <laughs> Uh Gibson, the street finds its use. Um, so. You know, I, when I sort of originally built the thing, I was very much in that sort of library mode. I was I was really thinking about sort of outreach libraries, uh, especially public libraries often struggle sort of to to do outreach into their communities. And so I, you know, I was thinking very simply, I was thinking sort of wouldn't it be great if a library could load up a bunch of public domain books and take the router down with them to the farmer's market or to their, you know, local elementary school or to, you know, just wherever the library happened to need to be, they could take their, you know, take these resources with them and people could, you know, grab a book as they walked by from their mobile phone. Right. Again, this was, 2012 right so like it's a decade ago it's kind of hard to imagine what th that space was like but um you know it was still pretty young it, the, the mobile phone use the iphone was certainly around but smartphones were around but we were on like the iphone 4 or something right like everything had just gone retina it was a very early <laughs> it was very early in the sort of growth of smartphones and so the uh you know the the idea the original idea was sort of outreach to uh to the communities right L one of the great strengths of libraries is that they're so tied to their sort of communities and what they you know what the community is uh you know needs and so i thought let's let's see if that's a tool let's see if this sort of helps the library bridge those gaps into spaces that they couldn't otherwise get digital things into right you build one of these you throw some public domain books on on there you take it out and you see you know see what kind of uptake you get from your uh from your community now that was the original idea um as the project grew a little bit i realized that with a little bit of funding and a little, you know, if I could, if I could find a way to make a little bit of money using the project, I could get some help with some of the programming. I could make a few things easier and I could, um, you know, I, I, I had a sort of a glimmer that it could do a little more. And so, um, I think it was 20, let's see, when was the, when was a Kickstarter project? Kickstarter project would have been about, I guess, maybe late 20, mid 2013, something like that. No, 20, yeah, 2013, mid 2013 would have been the Kickstarter project. So uh, I did eventually, so we, we sort of had a little bit of time where it was just, just mostly in the library world and there were people playing with it, different academic libraries were playing with it to take, you know, taking books out to dorms and public libraries were playing with it. And I had I had this idea that, you know, obviously it could do a little more. And so started a Kickstarter project again pretty early. This is 2013. So I mean, Kickstarter had been around a little while, but um, uh, crowdfunding and everything had not um, it, certainly not the size it is now. And uh, I thought, 
this is a little tiny library project, right? This is maybe I'm going to get 30 people to sign on, right? This is cool. Let's, let's, let's see if I can get 30 people to help me build the, the 2.0 version. Let's just see if I can do that. So I put it up and uh, it ended up on Boing Boing at the time. Uh, actually, Corey uh, noticed it and uh, put it up on Boing Boing. And it ended up getting a, a huge amount of traffic in ways that I did not expect. Um, bunch of news stories, et cetera. And it ended up being sort of about 12 times the size I thought it was going to be. Uh, instead of 30 people, I ended up with almost 500 people um, who uh, who backed the project. And instead of raising, I think my goal for the Kickstarter was about $3,000. And instead, I raised like 30 some thousand dollars. And so wow. it's the typical sort of problem where, you, you know, uh, scale scale is hard. And so I ended up having to work through that. Um, that did give me the capital, though, to sort of try to get a couple of people to help pay some developers to help me with uh, some of the, you know, the, the deep magic that I wasn't quite uh, wasn't quite capable of getting to myself. And uh, we eventually used that to sort of, you know, kickstart the uh, the 2.0 version. And that was where things got really interesting because it uh, got a lot more notice and people started finding those street uses. Um, and the ones that I am, I'm sorry, go ahead, Doc. You're, no, no, you're signaling I, I, I me. Finish this because I, I basically okay. wanted to say, you have an awesome story, but I also need to do an ad. <laughs> I, that was my guess. That was my guess. I don't want to keep you from that. Well, so, this is, um, so well, this this is a this is yeah. a great let's tease. do it. Let's do a break. Let's leave them and then hanging. I'll tell you the uses. <laughs> Let everybody know that this episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Collide. This Collide with a K. The challenge with device security has always been that it's difficult to scale. The bigger you are, the more edge cases you introduce, and the easier it is for significant issues to escape your notice. When remote work took over, we all remember that the challenge got exponentially harder. Whether you're a fast-growing startup that needs to graduate from managing device inventory in Google Sheets or an enterprise trying to speed up service desk issues, you need visibility into your fleet of devices in order to meet security goals and keep everything running smoothly. But how do you achieve that visibility when your design team uses Macs, accounting's on Windows, and your most talented developers, of course, are on Linux? Well, you get Collide. Collide is an endpoint security solution that gives IT teams a single dashboard for all devices, regardless of their operating system. Uh, Collide can answer questions MDMs can't. Questions like, do you have production data being stored on devices? Are all your developers SSH keys encrypted? And a host of other data points that you have to write a custom shell script in order to learn about. Think about it. If a Linux vulnerability is exposed tomorrow, how will you figure out how many machines are at risk? File a ticket with the team that manages your MDM and wait days to get a report back. Send a mass email and hope the Linux users open it. With Collide, you have real-time access to your fleet's data. And instead of installing intrusive agents or locking down devices, Collide takes a user-focused approach that communicates security recommendations to your employees directly on Slack. You can answer every question you have about your fleet without intruding on your workforce. Visit collide.com slash floss to find out how. If you follow that link, they'll hook you up with a goodie bag. It includes a t-shirt just for activating a free trial. That's K-O-L-I-D-E dot com slash floss. Okay, so Jason, you 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 were saying I had I had to cut you off as you're getting into a kind of a midpoint in your story. This is a long story, and it's good. We like. Sorry that. about that. So, apologies. Uh, it's uh, you know have an hour. No, no apologies necessary. I this is what we, it, what we do. It's cool. you know it get, it gets it gets it gets longer in the retelling. I apologize, but um, <laughs> you know the. Uh, so with the rise of the 2.0, the Kickstarter, the ability of me, I, I was actually able to get sort of the lead pirate box uh, developer to sort of do some dual development between the two projects. Uh, Matthias Struble, who's a fantastic, uh, fantastic developer, um, helped with the sort of development of the 2.0. And when that came out and we sort of we added a few little 
uh, bells and whistles made the installation even easier. It suddenly sort of started exploding. Now, one of the really uh, difficult parts of talking about use is um, it's specifically designed like this tool uh, was specifically designed not to connect to the internet, right? Like it's intentionally designed not to talk to other things. It, it's its own little hyper local network. And so I have no idea who's using it. <laughs> like I literally, you know, <laughs> literally have no way to know who's using it. Um, I could track downloads of the, of the code base, but I, I couldn't like know when someone built a new one or where it was being used or what was happening on it. And that obviously that's intentional, right? Um, it's one of the other sort of design and development goals. Libraries for those who may not know this uh, are incredibly sensitive to privacy issues and are really, really worried about people not knowing the information that you are accessing through them. And so that was sort of one of the design goal number, you know, design goal number one, uh, privacy. Um, but I did hear from people. I did end up hearing from people with, you know, feedback and, and, and emails and things that came in. And some of the, some of the use cases that were the most fascinating were the, um, English teacher in, uh, China who contacted me and said, you know, I want to be able to share texts with my students and the great firewall keeps me from doing it. Right. But I being sort of, you know, uh, of a higher uh, economic stature in China can afford a VPN and my VPN allows me to connect through another country and get the texts I want, but then I can load them locally to my, to my library box, take that into my classroom where the students themselves can then download the material locally. And almost as importantly, uh, that box doesn't connect to the larger network. And so nobody knows I'm doing it. Right. There's this sort of hidden network now that um, that people can grab the material from. Um, so that was that was a, a really big one. Right. Um, the other one was I worked with a group in um, Ghana who were trying to get first aid and nursing information out into extremely remote areas to do uh, basically first aid training and just general health, you know, general health training, um, in, uh, in, uh, in Ghana. And so they, uh, I worked with them to build a handful of library boxes to preload with, uh, medical, um, you know, medical textbooks. And then those were actually run because the, the hardware we were using the TP link MR, MR 3020s and 3040s, uh, they they run on standard USB, you know, five volt, one amp power. It's super super low, uh, super super low energy. They can run off of a fairly small solar panel really easily, and so they were running those in extremely remote areas with a solar panel on the roof and the box hanging under a an eave, right? And then the community could come through and grab things using um, using whatever device they had. So the those sorts of uses were um, sort of integral in the way sort of the, the development started going. We started trying to internationalize the, you know, internationalize the um, the interface. We did uh, a call for pub to the public to do uh, translations of our interface. We ended up with about 15 different languages that uh, the interface was translated into. And we used a, an open source um, library from, I believe, Mozilla to, uh, you know, we threw that into the project in order to be able to do localization for languages. Um, so those were, I mean, those are the, the, the sort of uses that, that, made me, you know, set up and take notice. It was these, you know, getting the information to the people that needed in the places that they need it without limit to the infrastructure that was in that area. That was the, the, the turning point for the project really was when we realized that, 
Uh, it wasn't just this like tool for libraries, but it was this tool for anywhere with a certain need that did not have the in infrastructure to fill that need. That was the right. that was a, a huge turning point. Yeah, for sure. And I can see both of those use cases. In fact, I may recommend this to uh, well, we'll talk about whether I should recommend it or not based on <laughs> sure. uh, FCC and some other things, but. <laughs> well, it, it would be a great project. I can see like a, a Boy Scout who is who yep. wants a project for their um, uh, what is it, Eagle Scout project or something yep. like that to be able to take one of these and put all of the like the first aid information and the stuff that you're going to need in the wilderness and then show how you can just package it up and take it with you uh, while you're while you're out. Uh, you know, exploring without any internet access. So I don't know if anybody's done that, but I might, I may reserve this project for a uh, boy scout that I, uh, that needs some help uh, trying to figure this yeah. out. But anyway, that's a side uh, note. Um, my question was, you know, in the, in the interface, because it's going to be obvious when you're, when there's no internet around that you're not connected to the internet, yep. but when there is internet and you're, it's that first use case where you want to provide an Island of something that's not connected to the other network, right? How does yeah. the user know, the end user know that they're not connected to the internet? Is there, like, are they gonna go on here and, cause you were saying they expect to be connected a lot of times online. Yep. Is there some signal that says, hey, you're in a private environment. You can only access these things. I mean. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it discoverability and that that sort of first use, like how do people find it? That's actually some of the hardest problems um for a project like this right it's yeah. it's designed to not be sort of findable in a certain way right and so how do you find something <laughs> that's designed to not be findable um so we, we we tried to solve it in a couple of ways um one of those was that we re we had a, a a recommendation for sort of uh network naming the router itself right what what ends up being uh, seen by devices is just another just a wi-fi network right it's just a it's just a a, a wi-fi network that's being produced by this tiny little box in a tiny little area right the hardware that we that we use the 3040s and the 3020s um you know they're smaller than a deck of cards they're 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 tiny tiny little uh little plastic um you know routers and as a result the antennas are not very big and the uh power that they are pushing out is not very large and so the sort of bubble of access is 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 pretty small e even in a entirely open field you're only talking about maybe 50 feet right like mm. in a 50 foot sphere right it's it's a it's a pretty tightly controlled little little access point uh just because there's only so much power and only so big an antenna that you can put in something that size um and so discoverability was was a was a big thing now you know you can go looking right so you know if you indicate somehow hey check 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 for this SSID, right? Like open up your Wi-Fi and take a look. And so we have, you know, signage and we had QR codes that would automatically, you know, automatically attach people to the SSID or, or, or tell them what the SSID was. Um, the signal could be uh, either open or uh, you, you, you could throw a, a password on it. That was the, up to the up to the, um, you know, person in doing the install. We, we had a, a, tr a, a trigger for that, uh, setting for that. And so, you know, you could, you could have an entirely open Wi-Fi signal where somebody just jumped on and, you know, boom, it just looked like a website, right? Like there was, you connect to the web, you connect to the SSID, you open your browser and what you get is, Hey, you're connected to a library box. Here's the choices. Right? Here's here's your books. Here's your uh, here's your uh, um, you know. Do you want to download uh, open source movie right uh, or a, a, a non non copyrighted um, movie? Do you want to whatever? Um, so that was the sort of you know opening uh, experience for people. Um, but it it is a really hard. It's a it's a really hard user experience uh, thing to overcome is that first like yeah. how do you find a thing that's not sort of screaming at you to find it 
Um, right. We had that problem at, at Maker at a. I, I've done several uh, Maker Fair type events for uh, that support the makerspace I started whenever mm-hmm. that was ten years ago, I guess almost. Um, but the we wanted to use Pirate Box for it, but the problem we ran yeah. into is the feedback was, well, I can see the open Wi-Fi that the uh, venue gave us. And I can see this other one, right? But they didn't know the difference. So when they connected to the other one, they expected when they were connected to that SSID that they would just be able to open up Chrome and yep. browse and they couldn't, right? So that's kind of why I asked because uh, I think the um, the use case has to be clear. Yes. Uh, and, you, and you have to communicate the fact that the documents are here that you want to access, but there's no internet uh, internet access otherwise. Yep. Yeah. That, that it, it ended up being, uh, that is a, it's a, it's a tough user experience thing to sort of figure out the interface yeah. there, how you communicate it. <clears throat> People don't read things, right? No, nobody reads like the signs or, you know, <laughs> you just have big, big blink text that was like, this is not the internet, but, uh, it, it still wouldn't, it wouldn't help. Uh, it ended up being a lot of kind of user education through physical, if you were, doing it at an event or with a library at a conference. They ended up being used a lot at conferences. Um, they, uh, you know, there would be a, a sign, a QR code with instructions, uh, something that would give you that little bit of, you know, the first step. And then the hopefully once you got in, there was enough explanation on the interface that you, you could sort of see what was going on. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk just a little bit about the hardware for about yeah. three minutes. Um, sure. What is the current set of hardware that you recommend for this project? I mean, you said it runs on sure. OpenWRT, which I'm familiar yeah. with that, and and also DDWRT and the stuff that runs on the mm-hmm. Linksys. Uh, well, it runs everywhere, right, depending on the chipset. But it was known for running yeah. on the Linksys uh, products. But let's talk about, could I theoretically install this on any device that is capable of uploading the W uh, open WRT firmware? In, in, in theory, yes. Uh, certainly the, the underlying code would run basically anywhere that open WRT will, right? There's nothing magic about the, uh, about the hardware that we were using. The, uh, the real difficulty now is that mostly the project the project has been uh Cecil let's say I won't say entirely dead because there are still occasionally people who decide they want to try to build one uh but the 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 pirate box project formally ended in 2019 they sort of ceased sort of support and development and everything and library box was basically around the same uh time we were more or less developing on similar code bases underneath. And so without one, the other was not, not going to move forward very quickly. And so it's been a couple of years now, but the the project is again, I hate using the word dead, but I will say it is definitely no longer in development. Um, And, you know, I know we're, we're maybe sneaking up on another, uh, on another ad, you said three minutes. So I don't want to go too far into the story, but (laughs) I do want to talk about, (laughs) Uh, why everything died. And there are two big reasons. One of those is HTTPS and the other is the FCC. And I'm, I would love to explain why those two things killed the projects. Uh, but if we need to take a, take a little break before I get into that part of the story, right. I, I'm happy to do that. <laughs> wow. That, that, this is the first time I think where the guest has teased <laughs> what we're going to follow the ad with. <laughs> There's a there's a first for everything. So, <laughs> with that tease in mind, um, uh, this episode of Flux Weekly is brought to you by Code Comments, an original podcast from Red Hat. You know, when you're working on a project and you leave behind a small reminder in the code, a code comment to help others learn from your work, this podcast takes that idea by letting you listen in on two experienced technologists as they describe their building process. There's a lot of work required to bring a project from whiteboard to development, and none of us can do it alone. The host, Burr Sutter, is a Red Hatter and a lifelong developer advocate and a community organizer. In each episode, Burr sits down with experienced technologists from across the industry to trade stories and talk about what they've learned from their experiences. The latest one is with 
David Duncan. He's the senior manager of partner solutions um, uh, for Linux at AWS. And he came over from Red Hat. So these guys are former colleagues. And what he says about aligning with open source principles goes really pretty deep, looking at agility, meshing skill levels, the principle and practice of transparency, the need to roll back and have records so you can roll back. So it's not just about code uh, and decision records, the whole decision process. There's a lot in there, um, and I highly recommend going there. Episodes are available anywhere you listen to podcasts and at redhat.com slash code comments podcast. Search for code comments in your podcast player. We'll also include a link in the show notes. My thanks to code comments for their support. <laughs> So, Jason, <laughs> pick pick it up, dude. <laughs> <There you were. laughs> sure thing. Yeah. So uh, we were talking about the hardware and talking about you know what would you what would you choose if you know if you wanted to sort of build the project now. Um, sadly, the answer is you need to go back to about 2015 and buy a piece of hardware um, <laughs> because. In, um, in uh, 2016, I believe it was, yeah, that would have been the time the rulemaking happened. So mm -hmm. in 2016, the FCC decided to change the rules around um, 802.11, around 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz band um, radio chips, chipsets. And the change in 2016 was that anything that any radio that enabled five gigahertz basically could not have the ability to alter its signal strength, right? So uh, the manufacturers of anything that included a five gigahertz uh, antenna basically were required to prevent users from manipulating the signal strength of that particular radio. So that was a rule that the FCC set in 2016. There are lots of ways that manufacturers could do this, but most of them, TP-Link included, did the sort of laziest thing they could do, which was just lock down the entire Wi-Fi chip stack with uh, encrypted firmware, right? And so, as of the sort of 2017, 2018 models of those routers, they started locking the firmware uh, chipsets such that OpenWRT was no longer able to be flashed onto them, mm. which has a problem when your entire project has to do with flashing firmware onto routers. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. So that was one, that was sort of one piece of the, I won't say downfall, but certainly the sort of slow slide of, uh, you know, the project becoming less relevant. Uh, the other was actually something that, yeah, the, the, not a big fan of the, of the manufacturers doing that personally. I was a fan of the other problem, but it, it ended up being just about as significant. And that is um, the rise of browsers insisting on HTTPS by default, right? So it was a, in about the same time period. This was like 2015, 2016, 2017. Um, I think it was 20, late 2017 or late or early 2018 when Chrome finally said, uh, you know, all HTTP sites are marked as not, you know, plain HTTP is marked as not secure and you get pop-ups that warn you about them and things. So this was the time period, 2015, 2016, 2017, when most browsers started turning on the switch that was like, no, 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 we really just want HTTPS. Now that's again, fantastic for the open web. I think, you know, overall that's a, that's a, that's a, a, a general good but we were developing a web browser, a, a, a web server, right? That was incapable of using SSL certificates because it's an island that can't do any root certificate checking. There's no, like you right. can't, there's no there there, right? For the, for the chain of uh, certification. 
And so what ended up happening was as browsers starting started to default to HTTPS only or HTTPS primary, someone would connect to a library box or a pirate box and pull up the site and immediately start getting warnings. Right. And that is just game over, right? Like you're talking about a user interface problem. That is just like, okay, yeah, you're. I'm going to tell you that this thing you just connected to, no, 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 really, just go ahead and accept that insecurity. And, you know, that it's, no, it's, it's just a yeah. losing battle at that point. And there's no way, I guess, because there's no way to verify the certificate because you're not connected, right? There's no way around yep. that, really. I was trying to nope. figure out if there was a way to spoof it. Uh, yep. somehow, Believe but... me, we we tried an <laughs> enormous number of things. We tried some truly, truly ridiculous solutions. Um, and the, I mean, again, right? It's it in general, it's good. It can't be spoofed, right? Like, I mean that. That's actually what you want. You don't want people right. to be able to spoof SSL, right? Like that's, <laughs> I'm, I'm glad it cannot be spoofed quite as easily. Um, but yeah, there was no good sort of, no good solution to having a box that never connects to the internet that can't, shouldn't connect to the internet, that doesn't have any broader network connectivity at all, but wants to use SSL certs. They're just, they're, there's, there is not a good networking solution for that. So yeah. I run that, into this a lot. Uh, I, yeah. I mean, that's kind of like the Achilles heel here and it's nothing to do with the project. Mm -hmm. It's nothing to do with uh, really nefarious things going on. It's just a side effect of the way that the industry, in this case, the web browsing industry has decided to go for security and privacy reasons. So it's like a, it's like a really yep. bad side effect of a good, good intentions. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's, it, it was again, like I entirely support it, even though it more or less killed two projects that I really love. Right. Um, it, it, it is the right solution for the sort of world networked world we live in, but man, it, it, between the between the, those two things, between the FCC's locking down and manufacturers locking down firmware, and then you know the HTTPS becoming the standard for all browser, uh, you know all browser calls was like, wow, okay. I mean, you know, very little you can do uh, to get around those two things. So that was the. Yeah sort of you know that was 2018 2019 and by 2019 it was very clear both uh, i mean you know matthias struble the lead developer for pirate box and i worked together very closely and it was by that point both of us were like i i just i don't know even i don't know how to solve this right i think we're, we're we were at an impasse to the degree where yeah not doesn't doesn't really work anymore so yeah. So the project is still there. The project it still is. works fine. It does. It's just yep. that end users are going to have to put up with going through, if they're using a browser, which they probably are, clicking the little, I don't care about the security implications, go away, security warning thing yep. before they can actually get to the site, which is a huge annoyance. Yeah. But it's, it's a, it's it a huge burden. It is. It, but it is, the, yeah, yeah, it is the way it is. And again, like there is not a good solution for it. Um, and it's probably good that there's not a good solution, <laughs> which is. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I was thinking like, well, in terms of the hardware, couldn't this, couldn't you do the same thing with a custom built ESP 32 type device, right. That can act as its yep. own router. Um, yep. And then have, you know, files off to the side on like an SD yep. card or something like that, that you do. Cause I'm just thinking about, oh, I could create this. I could go out and design this thing, oh, yeah. have it be small, small form factor, put it in a little box and basically yep. do the same thing. But yep. the bottom line is you're still going to come back that that would kind of get around the FCC stuff, but you're still yep. going to come back to this problem of the, the HTTPS. This is an insecure site. Warning. Yep. Yeah, you're st you're still going to have that issue pop up regardless. And you know, you you obviously, you know, the 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 plethora of open hardware at this point in time is so rich. Like you you know, you mentioned the ESPs, the uh, you know, you've got 
uh, you've got Raspberry Pi, uh, you know, incredibly small uh, Raspberry Pis that have wireless now. When we started the project, Raspberry Pis didn't even have built-in Wi-Fi yet, right? Mm -hmm. Like, again, it's sort of hard to go back in time and remember what the state of hardware was at the, you know, 10 years ago, but uh, Raspberry Pis didn't have built-in Wi-Fi at the point. Otherwise we probably would have used those instead, right? We would have, right. we would have built the project from the beginning on a Pi. But at the time when we were doing the initial development, buying a Raspberry Pi and a, a USB Wi-Fi dongle that the Pi would use and hoping that the driver stack for that was all going to be nice and stable. Yep. All of those things, you know, the, the, the Pi plus the Wi-Fi, uh, plus the Wi-Fi dongle was more expensive than buying one of these off the shelf pre-built TP link routers. And so it, it didn't make any sense to use the Pi at the time. Now there's, I, you know, five different, platforms you could probably pick off a shelf well in in you know non-hardware lean times you can it's still hard to find a raspberry pi right now for whatever reason um yeah but uh yeah you you could you could find multiple platforms now to be able to build a project similar to it and there are definitely other projects in this vein uh that are still sort of live in the space that still get, you know, they still get caught by the whole HTTPS thing, but there are other projects that there's internet in a box, uh, is one. Um, there's a handful of them that, um, that sort of continue this idea of yeah. self-contained, small, portable, cheap, right. you know, delivery. And there's a lot of like cloud storage type, uh, projects that would would kind of fit the same bill but you like you say they're all good if they're offline um yeah. then they're all going to have this this issue so yeah yeah they're going to run into that networking the ssl issue sort of is a is a is a hard is a hard stop for anything that never connects to the internet yeah hmm. so so boy we we i think we've got like about seven minutes left something like that and and i want to get to your measure the future project because i think it's an interesting one and it's another one it's sort of a re related matter but I, w I want to throw a bit of a context on it that i actually got from um one of my sons your boss's wife's brother <laughs> who, who said back in 2003 he wasn't even that technical a guy a little bit though um uh he said at that time well the the internet is splitting between what he called the live web and the static web. The static web is the one we had. It's the one we thought was a library. You know, you had domains with locations and addresses that you could go to as this real estate metaphor. The internet archive, in fact, is based on that assumption that we're, there's a static body of work that's going to persist in virtual space, but it was like physical space. We can metaphorically understand it as physical space. And then we have things happen in the future, you know, I was joking on the back channel that 2013 used to be the future that it was now, and now it's way too long ago. But things like the FCC coming up with the, the you know, guidance or requirements that chip makers use to obsolesce exactly what you're doing, you know, or HTTPS, basically obsolescing an entire body of work that's just sitting there on HTTP on old servers that work fine and serve. My old blog is there. Lots of stuff that I've written in the past is sitting out there behind HTTP and, you know, and you get warnings and all that. So, but libraries are about what persists, right? So, and we're sitting in this live web now where the evanescent and the current seems to be the context for everything. So, how how are you seeing where we're going with this or how we're and maybe work this into the measure of the future project and what you've learned through that yeah the you're 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 touching on a lot of sort of really interesting library information science topics uh in in that in that comment i mean the um the difficulty of the current world for libraries and archives is is enormous because of that sort of live nature of it and the 
the the the way things have evolved digital information has evolved from uh as you say sort of what we could understand more or less as metaphorical spaces a site a place a thing um and have moved to a stream instead of a a a static sort of place um we could have an, an entire discussion it's probably not a floss discussion but we could have an entire discussion and i would love to at some point uh about sort of the change in the way that information science deals with those problems uh and archives deal with those problems and the challenges of the stream versus the place um i think that's a it's a fascinating discussion um for the purposes of the sort of measure the future project uh that was the other open hardware open uh software project that i built for libraries uh library box was definitely the bigger project of the two that i've created uh but measure the future was a uh was interesting because it wasn't just about networking it was about um uh camera uh it was about using cameras to in a privacy centric secure way to measure um movement inside libraries and try to derive from that movement sort of attention what were people doing in the library that people should know about right so the idea was basically like uh, and again this was early this was oh gosh this was 2015 2014 um 2014 probably when this really started so you know a, a few years back um now there are lots of commercial projects that do this sort of work but when we were initially building it uh, it was using, uh, we started on the Intel Edison platform, which seemed like a promising platform. This is why hardware is terrible and no one should ever use it. Uh, <laughs> it seemed really promising. And uh, Intel ceased production literally halfway <laughs> through our version one cycle, right? Yep. Uh, they killed the hardware and we were like, uh, okay, all right. Um, so we, we eventually moved over to the Pi, to the Raspberry Pi, um, for it, but it was using, um, uh, uh, using, you know, camera and some, uh, some, uh, machine vision work to identify individuals and how long and what they did in a space, but without identifying those individuals and without recording anything about the people themselves uh, <clears throat> again it was one of these interesting challenges inside libraries where we want information to be able to make decisions about how best to serve communities but we don't want to know anything about the individual people and the choices they're making um when it comes to the uh the information that they're seeking because privacy is so important. And so Measure the Future was this really specific challenge of how can we gather information but do so privately and give us actionable sort of metrics about library spaces that we can use to make changes and make things better. That was the overall vision for, for that project. And it was an incredible challenge, really, really fun. Um, we did some really, I think, good work. We ended up partnering with a bunch of uh, libraries in the U.S. and we ran an alpha program and a beta program. Um, eventually, just sort of ran out of steam as far as development goes. That is still, it's all available and open and people can build their own if they want. Um, but as far as a, a, you know, sort of a commercial entity, we got, run, we, we just got overrun by the, by larger players basically. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I was also thinking about the, you know, what's going on, uh, uh, the, the, the crossover between privacy and access is really, really interesting. Right. Cause now you have uh, uh, on kind of a separate thread, <clears throat> you have libraries that in, in school libraries in particular that are removing books because of where they live uh florida other places that are saying you can't have access to certain books either in the school system 
or in the library or, you know, other places, right? Mm -hmm. It's really kind of, uh, kind of weird the time that we live in. Um, but the question is, you know, this may be a way I would, it would be kind of interesting to, to protest this in a way by going to a library, finding a hidden uh, plug in the wall or just using the battery powered devices, putting in one of these devices with all of those banned books on it. Right. And just yeah. saying ban banned books <laughs> here, you know, yeah. and then people yeah. could access those. And I know that there's other solutions to this. New York Public Library uh, has actually made, whether you're a library member, live in New York or not, they've made all these banned books available for anyone that wants to go download them. But I still like the idea of a little bit of social uh, protest here by using a device like this just to give access to information for people where they don't have to feel like they're going to be tracked or monitored in some way, you know, they may have concerns about yep. that given their local regulations where they live. So any thoughts yep. on that? Yeah, that's the, uh, yeah, the, uh, one of the, one of the best quotes about libraries. Um, and I, I'm going to absolutely forget in the moment who said it. Um, but, um, it is that libraries are the last public space where you can go and not be tracked. Right. That's mm -hmm. like, um, yeah. one of the great things about, uh, the library, public, academic, school, and elsewhere. And so, yeah, I absolutely agree. Uh, using it as a, um, uh, using it as a way to get information to people who need that information, regardless of whether other people want them to have that information or not, right? That's the, that's one of the brilliant things about these little, about the library box project, about pirate box. That was the original, one of the original sort of underlying goals for David Dart's, you know, 2010 experiment with pirate box was what can we, uh, what can we do to get people to share information, to have information in places that, you know, they, they need it. And so that was, it, it goes right back to the sort of origin story of the entire idea. Mm -hmm. So Jason, I wanted to ask you in the little time we have left, which is actually close to none, but we'll pretend it isn't um, a little bit about NISO, about your day job and oh, yeah. what it is and <laughs> And because uh, I have a feeling you're not fit, <laughs> there's no failure yet in that. <laughs> no. I, I, it's a pretty important institution, I think. So a few words yeah. about it. Well, thank you. Yeah, yeah. So NISO, for those who don't know, is the National Information Standards Organization uh, and is the body in the U.S. that oversees the development of uh, information standards. So any sort of uh, background technology that uses a communication standard to talk between say a publisher and a library or a library and a vendor or um, you know any of those sorts of background pieces of infrastructure that uh, are necessary in order to sort of make information flows work. NISO is the organization in the US that has probably built that little piece of um, that little piece of technology. And my particular role in the organization is, um, you know, strategic initiatives is a vague sort of title, but um, my, my particular role is largely to sort of look at the space and see where new and interesting stuff is happening and try to pull that in and make that available inside the org to, you know, sort of develop into projects and develop into working groups. And so uh, I'm always on the always on the look for new and exciting things happening in the in the information uh, publishing space. So I'll we'll have to have you back to talk about some of those. I, I was thinking about your title. Um, my title once a thousand years ago was area coordinator. <laughs> <laughs> nice. You can't get much more vague than that, <laughs> like, like director of interrelations or, or, yeah. or something like that. Um, so, uh, uh, so we, we always conclude with uh, a couple of questions, which um, uh, if you're not busy hacking now, may, you may not want to answer, I don't know, but uh, they are, what are your favorite text editor and scripting language? Ooh, uh, text editor, probably BB edit. I still still end up falling back into BB edit a lot for uh, yeah. for work that I do and um, scripting language. 
Uh, I work on Macs and Apple pro- products, and a lot of the stuff that I do is local. So I'm going to say Apple Script. I still do a, a fair amount of stuff. Oh my gosh! Uh, using this is using two, <laughs> two yeah. Apple items. BB Edit is also Apple, but uh, it's pretty it's it's pretty good. I've always wished they were open source, but they are not. And yeah. uh, as far as I know, anyway, I haven't looked at them in no. in a couple of years. But um, no. but that's th- this is great. It's, it's, I, I'm sorry we didn't have enough time because there's really so much more no. to talk about. And you've been an it's awesome great. guest. And really thank you a lot for coming on the show. And say Thanks hi a lot Tom. for inviting me. This has been super fun. <laughs> Likewise. So, <laughs> so Aaron, that was great. Yeah, I mean, super interesting product. Like I said, I played around with uh, Pirate Box back when it came out. Um, and so I just, I like the idea of having a way to have information uh, like this at your fingertips. I think a lot of people like the Boy Scout example I gave, they don't realize, you know, like, Oh, you know, okay, guys, like we, we need to be uh, uh, out in the wild. Uh, You're not going to have any cell phone connection or internet connection. You know, that's true, but there's so much wealth of information available on the internet, like how to set a fractured leg or something like that, that may be actually be really useful um, or training materials or things like that. So I, I, I'm really interested in that aspect of the project, even though the limitations that we discussed in terms of the certificate authentication and things like that, you know, in those settings, it wouldn't really matter because everybody would just know, oh yeah, I'm going to get that stupid warning. I'll just go ahead and just click by that and say, it's okay to browse the site. Um, so super interesting project, a lot of great history, obviously that we discussed and a lot of good implications for, you know, both privacy and access to information. So yeah, it's still up there. It's, it makes me want to do that project anyway, even though I know there's going to be <laughs> issues with it. I just want to kind of get out an ESP32 and make it happen or find similar projects that I can download and, and uh, just explore the code for, because I think it's really important. Well, maybe, maybe one of our listeners or viewers uh, could, could do the same or get together and try and make something happen. Uh, like you said, the code's all out there. It's going to be in, uh, in our show notes, uh, for sure. Um, there's just a lot there. Um, a big takeaway for me is really how the net is the net and the net is everywhere and it is the matrix in some ways. I mean, you can't get out of it, you know, you're in it. And, um, when you try to, and you try to do something that's isolated and that uses the protocols, but you're limited in a, in a number of ways. It's just kind of sad. Um, uh, I know, I know some, um, writers and thinkers, Dave Weiner is probably the biggest one. Love to have him on, him on the show sometime, doing awesome work lately. Um, uh, who's l- laments constantly, not constantly, but often about how a lot of his old stuff, he's never going to go back and fix those servers. But they're sitting there right. serving HTTP. Uh, my old blog is sitting on one. Um, I, I want, it's archival. I don't recall getting any warnings going there, but maybe you get warned once and I've been there more than once and and there's a cookie saying I, I got warned one time. I don't know, yeah. but I do know that it, 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 HTTP is deprecated and that's not good. I, I think there's, yep. we, we shouldn't have useful protocols that are fully deprecated like that, mostly by practice, you know, and, um, and I'm, there's probably a fix for it. Some, some, something you could put in the HTML, I mean, in the, you know, in the index page HTML that will say, you know, there's a legacy site, no harm going, no, nothing harmful here. I don't know, but it needs to be addressed somehow, I think, because it's, it's kind of tragic how that's going. Yeah, but this sure. is a great show. I've got the, I've got the answer, by the way, Doc. Oh. Let's bring back Gopher. <laughs> Go all the way back. Yeah, yeah, let's just bring back Gopher and there's no, uh, <laughs> no restrictions there. You know, that was a time before we had to worry about oh. that kind of stuff. <laughs> uh, the, the time before, I mean, I'm, I'm remembering the '80s and early '90s, and it, it, and that's that's all you had is that kind of stuff, you know. And exactly. Um, then the BBSs of a zillion kinds, and <laughs> so, so oh, show title: Free Servers in Africa, Australian or naughty. I, I haven't looked back at the back channel. They're recommending They're Gopher and Archie as well. I think that I think that's great. I remember, you know, just browsing, Archie, being able yeah. to browse libraries. That was a lot of, you know, taking this all the way back, this discussion. I yeah. mean, that was the first, my first use of the internet was being on 
uh, I think the service was called Ohio Link when I was in school. And it was just that. It was a connection to all the universities, uh, not all of them, but the ones that were connected to the internet at that point, which was still very early. And that's what we did. That's what I used the internet for the very first time was to go browse something at like Ohio State's library that I needed for a research paper. And it was all open and there wasn't any, you know, nobody was concerned about charging anything for anything. And it was all open. And it's like, it, it kind of, for those of us, especially that were around uh, back at that time, it does really make you nostalgic and desire a, a, a time where we could go back to to just having everything open and not having to worry about all these other things. But oh well, yeah, oh well, well it's it's it, it's more to talk about in the future. We need to move <laughs> on quickly. So uh, let everybody know next week is going to be a good one. Uh, one of my favorite people, Tim Pozar, who um, I know through broadcast through the ISP world. He's one of the earliest people there. He's all about that side of things. And at the same, it probably has something to say about today's show as well. Um, but also as a broadcast engineer, we're going to talk about broadcasting and about radio and what's happening to it. And Tim is like the best person I know of to talk about that. That is coming up next week and we will see you then. Let's do our plug. Oh, I'm so, mm. okay. Ah! <laughs> I went full Jersey on it. I'm sorry, I never got you the plug. Let's let's rewind. Um, right, so now we just <laughs> edit sorry, it. Aaron. No, no I'm worries. Sorry. So what do you see? What do you got to plug there, Aaron? Yeah. What so uh, as usual, I invite everyone to tune into my YouTube channel, Retro Hack Shack. Uh, if you like talking about all these old things that we were just discussing, uh, but specifically hardware, retro PCs, and uh, things like things of that nature. The the one that I just put out was all about the Atari Twenty Six Hundred. Uh, and 10 things you didn't know about the release of the Atari 2600 and how that went. I've got some other uh, cool episodes coming up on that theme because it's the Atari 50th anniversary. So I've got some, uh, you know, some new, sort of new, it's not going to come through with the background, is it? You can kind of see them there. Uh, Aqua Venture and Yars Return, if I move that one over this way, there we go. You can kind of see it. Uh, I've got some uh, cartridges from uh, new cartridges from Atari that where they went old school, put them in the box, you know, the big box and uh, some pretty cool games. So I'll be talking about those in a future episode, but definitely tune in to Retro Hack Shack over on YouTube if you're interested in uh, that kind of stuff. Excellent. Thanks. And, and then again, we'll have Tim Pozar up next week. He's going to be great. We will see you then. Hey folks, I'm Ant Pruitt. And what do you get your favorite tech geek that has everything? A Club Twit gift subscription, of course. Twit podcasts keep them informed and entertained with the most relevant tech news podcasts available. With the Club Twit subscription, they get access to all of our podcasts ad free. They also get access to our members only discord, access to exclusive outtakes behind the scenes and special content such as AMAs, which I just love hosting. Plus, exclusive shows such as Hands on Mac, Hands on Windows, and the Untitled Linux Show. Purchase your geek's gift at twit.tv slash club twit, and it will thank you every day.